we're back now with Norman. We want to talk about something else. This piece is, uh, is very different from the others. It, it lends itself to a little more geometry. And, uh, but this is the finished product that you will see. But I wanted Norman to talk about the process, which is fascinating of how it, how it got to this point in, uh, from here to there. So this was a frotage to start with? Yes, uh, a very large frotage off of the kitchen floor. <laughs> and then a section of that frotage uh, was taken out to create this image, which is uh, referred to in the title, the floor gnarler. Now the floor gnarler has a little bit to do with the emotion of the moment. And uh, what's interesting is you, you talk about geometry. However, when you look at the early stages of mm -hmm. this, it starts out very organic. Right. Uh, some people have told me that this was looking to them like a shoreline and this was a little island. Right. Um, now, what happened at the, on your floor in order for you to see this as a piece of art? Well, my floor got flooded, and, and I had to have someone come in and pull up the linoleum. Okay. And when they pulled up the linoleum, it left all kinds of three-dimensional surfaces. Some of the glue came up, some of it did not, and it left a lot of texture. Right. And so that texture could be translated through frotage into images. In this case, the floor and arler. And interestingly enough, the drawing, when I get started, I use uh, a waterproof black ink so I don't, I, I don't want it to eradicate off of the linoleum block because this image is printed off of a piece of battleship linoleum. Mm. And once I clean the ink off, in this case, white ink on top of black ink, I want those lines to remain. But when I start carving, I go on a journey with the carving tool. So unlike here, this is very organic. As it evolves into the next step, you begin to see the geometry starting to emerge. It's all done on the basis of that very first drawing. Right. In, in the initial stages, the contour of this image is done by cutting away all of the linoleum uh, so that it can print on top of a solid background, which is printed from a separate sheet of linoleum. And all in, in careful registration, because this one is printed on a, on a press. It doesn't mean that you can't carefully register without using a press. That, that yeah. would be a misnomer. But this now, one earlier you t let, let, For the registering earlier, you were explaining that to me where when you make the next image, you have to make sure it's lined up exactly the way the last one was. Yeah, whether it's printed by hand or not, right. uh, you still have to do that if you're a really good printmaker. Right. However, there are a lot of printmakers who deliberately don't register. So uh, again, when it comes to additioning, you try to do reasonable and very accurate facsimiles of the, right. ma of the master printer, like in the lithograph, there's a, a, a term called bonaturé, which is the master print. When, when you get the bonaturé, the master printer uses that as the model print for all the other prints that are done. But that was a collaborative setting. This is not a collaborative setting. Right. In this case, the artist is the printer. In, in this, uh, we're skipping through some of the stages, but this print has a total number of nine states before it reaches its climax in this particular print, which has an addition number on it. What is it? One, one out of 16. One out of 16. So the total number of finished impressions is 16. That happens to be print number one. This is uh, number seven. So there are two more stages after seven before you reach the final stage here. Right. I think I had a comment about this one because I was posting it online as I was doing it, and uh, s someone said something about, oh, I think it was my brother-in-law who's a composer. Uh, he said it th he thought it looked a little bit too patriotic. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I just said, I didn't want to be making a patriotic print. I just wanted to be making a print. So right. I decided to add more colors. So while you got that one, so I see the blues and the reds, which are in here, 
But then there's also the yellows and the even lighter colors, but mostly the orange or the yellow. I guess it's an orange. Yeah, and then kinda. the very last one is, is a gold, but it's gold. hard to it's hard to see that gold. So the next time you put this this back in the exact position, then you add another l color. But I cut, I, I remove parts of the block. Okay. Uh, before I do that, that way what was previously printed will show through. Gotcha. So every time you make a step, if you cut something away, you retain what was printed the previous, on the previous impression. Okay. I got you. So you cut away everything that ends up being the next color or the next colors as you plan it out. Yeah, and then again, you have to make that decision. And all, well, anything I create, I have to decide what's going to be the last element before I bring it to closure. Wow. So these take more than 10 minutes to make. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would think so. I yeah. mean, that sounds like well, a, a big process and, and to and get to that just, point. That's just one artist. Now, right. I have uh, someone who just, one of, one of my colleagues who's a member of the uh, Atlanta Printmaker Studio just uh, presented me with a little uh, dry point that she did of a pine cone, and she wrote an article, uh, a beautiful article about why she's so infatuated and committed to doing pine cones. Hmm. And the article talks about how it goes all the way back to when she was a little girl wow. in Vermont. Yep. She, she started her interest in drawing pine cones as a little girl. And, and, never she, left. And, and she's brought it all this distance in her pine cone images, which are mostly reduction lino blocks, right. are beautiful, except in this one case, it was a dry point. Now, dry points are done by just scratching on the metal with a sharp, like a high carbon steel tool or a diamond point steel, mm -hmm. and you can't get very many impressions off mm. of a dry point. I'm, I feel so lucky that she gave that to me. Wow, that's amazing. So this one is so different and not different from the one we just looked at. So what happens in your life to where you say, okay, now I'm going into this as opposed to my Texas well, inspired piece? Yeah, this, this is, I shouldn't be saying this, but it, it's a little bit difficult to say. I can say it straightforward, but that one was created when, I was, when my wife was still alive. Right. This one was not, okay. and neither were the other assemblages. Those came after we parted company. Right. And it was, it was a sudden parting. Hmm. So that changed your life and your art. Yeah. But I have people who talk to me about that, and you have either you give up or you go on and you just reform everything and kind of reconstitute everything you're doing and continue to live life and try to get as much out of it as you can. Well, I think you have. Uh, well, this is wonderful. That, the learning the process and seeing the final product and everything else that was involved is... Uh, it's just fascinating. So we're going to move on to some sculpture now and learn something else about uh, Norman's artistic uh, journey.